Hello and welcome to Commodity Champions. I'm Anisha Gupta. Well, the commodities are in a bull run with gold at all-time highs, silver, copper, aluminum, zinc are at a multi-month highs. Even the soft commodities are surging with palm to rubber and cocoa hitting in all-time highs as well. There is support from geopolitical tensions in the Middle East to upcoming elections in many countries, inflation concerns, supply disruptions, improving economic data and Chinese demand. Add to that, the volatile fiat currencies have all led to buying in tangible commodities. With our experts today, we discuss on the part commodities can play in your portfolio. Joining us now is Lakshmi Ayer, CEO of Investment and Strategy at Kotak Alternative Asset Managers and Vikram Dhawan is Fund Manager, Commodities at Nippon India Mutual Fund. Thank you so much for joining us. Lakshmi, let me start with you. I do understand that when it comes to India, there is a lot more bent towards equities and very less towards other asset classes. But what is it that you've sensed in last few years, especially now when commodities do look like the flavor of the season? Yeah, hi, Manisha. So, yes, uh, typically uh, the, the natural tendency is to allocate to financial asset classes, which is largely equities and fixed income. And within that also, uh, depending on which theme is likely to do well, there is a tendency to allocate uh, to sectors. And within that, obviously, commodities do play an important role. But over the last few years, I think we've seen investor interest uh, gravitate towards not just uh, pure play uh, of financial asset classes, but also looking at uh, mediums um, uh, to participate in the commodities uh, as a sector on a slightly broader basis, uh, beginning with obviously precious metals, but uh, slowly and steadily you see it percolating to other commodities as well. But yes, predominantly gold and silver within the commodities pack uh, seem to be the preferred way for investors to participate. Mm. Lakshmi, you know, when you talk to people and they say, oh, I have a long-term portfolio, which I don't touch on these day-to-day -day or weekly or monthly uh, volatilities. How would you look at the definition of a near-term portfolio and a longer-term portfolio? So, Manisha, near-term can be next uh, one hour, uh, one week, one month. But when you are preparing and planning for your larger goals, your portfolios have to have uh, much longevity. And when I say longevity, it is north of 1,000 days. So anything tops of three years, three to five, seven years, I think that's the kind of minimum uh, long-term investment outlook that one needs to have. Um, and if you are a fill it, shut it, forget it kind of an investor, then you should look at a 10-year plus. So I think uh, uh, the definition of short-term and long term obviously will vary from people to people but i think ballpark if you look at a thousand day plus horizon which is three years plus plus i think it's a reasonable good horizon for any asset class to actually play or you know play out in your favor mm. vikram your initial comments as well when it comes to india portfolio and the way we create it and the uh, and the space or place or spot that commodities have within that um, hi, Manisha. Thank you for inviting me on your show. Uh, I think I'll add, I'll add to what uh, we said. And it, see, we are a commodity deficit country. I mean, uh, whether it is crude oil, gold, silver, even uh, in the new age metals, the battery metals, etc., uh, we don't have any significant capacities to produce to cater to uh, domestic demand. But uh, the unfortunate irony is that, uh, you know, unlike... Uh, you know, let's say maybe a Japan or let's say most of Europe, where they have given up on their local domestic, uh, you know, exchanges and they basically, you know, hedge or trade through either New York or London, or you have China, which has got a very strong homegrown commodities market. We are actually in the middle. Uh, we are neither uh, there or here. So I think what needs to be done is we need to have a very clear policy. Either we have a big thrust towards developing the Indian markets, which which live up to the global standards, or, and if that is something which is not viable, then I think even the local investors, local funds, should be permitted to you know ac uh, permitted access to the overseas uh, commodity markets. So unless we come out of this range, there will not be any significant traction or significant interest, either from the uh, fund houses, investors, 
or, or the participants. Mm. So, Vikram, as you as you said, India is a commodity deficit country, but an increasing population and increasingly th increasing thrust also when it comes to infrastructure and construction and defence and uh, make in India as per se, where you do need all of these commodities, but there are hardly any hedging mechanisms or investing mechanisms for that matter for a longer term portfolio. How do you see these uh, uh, in, in present in present scenario? And what is it that you think should be the changes made so that we have more commodities in portfolio? Sure. So I think, um, Manisha, I was fortunate enough to be in Europe when the entire thing took off in commodities. You know, prior to mid-90s, late-90s, uh, the market was dominated by traders and corporates, and the liquidity used to be what it used to be. But once the banks and the funds came in a big way, the liquidity just skyrocketed. And the participation, the cost of hedging, the cost of holding commodities, even the cost of, uh, you know, borrowing and lending in the commodity markets, just plummeted. So, so I think unless there is a big trust to, uh, you know, a push, I would say, to involve funds and banks uh, into the commodities in a big way, uh, I don't see the ground reality changing any uh, uh, significantly. Mm. Oh, well, yes, there's a lot that needs to be done. So, Lakshmi, when we do talk about commodities on whatever limited uh, avenues that we have right now, uh, whether you talk about underlying commodities, so whether it's, it's about futures, it's about ETFs right now and funds as well, what are the various things that an Indian portfolio manager looks at right now? Is it about safety, diversification, returns? What, what tops the mind? Well, I would say, Manisha, it is uh, all of these that you just mentioned in varying proportion. Uh, liquidity definitely is of paramount importance mm. because uh, every time an investor comes into a particular fund or a particular category, uh, the first port of call is the typical tendency to compare it with the most liquid category, which is the listed equities. Uh, and obviously, uh, then, then comes obviously what kind of returns potential uh, that the particular category has and how safe is it from an investment standpoint. So I think in varying combinations when a portfolio manager is constructing his or her portfolio, I think all of these um, uh, in, in, in the right proportion will be definitely an important ingredient. But uh, most important thing also needs to be kept in mind is that uh, when you are investing in uh, uh, a particular category of commodity, for example, uh, you are subject to the concentration risk. So I think uh, overarching, uh, uh, you know, all of these points that you mentioned is to keep in mind that when you are, and which is why uh, most of these categories should be used as complementary factors to your already existing diversified portfolio, or if you don't have a portfolio yet, and if you are planning to make one, a uh, portfolio manager, obviously, uh, when he or she will invest in that particular commodity, as I said, it's almost 100%. So I think that is one thing which one needs to keep in mind to ensure that there are no mishaps when you are in your investment stage. Well, that point is well taken. But uh, when you talk about commodities, and Vikram, this one is to you, the, the, you know, the, the conversation that you mostly hear on the road is that commodities are very niche. We do not understand. But so is the case with debt and uh, various other uh, things that people do own in their portfolios. Why is this uh, certain uh, aversion, if I can use that word, when it comes to within commodities? So, Manisha, that's uh, absolutely right. I mean, unlike debt and equity, commodities don't come with a balance sheet, penal account, or a rating. Mm. So, you need a vial of experience and expertise to handle that. Unfortunately, you know, I mean, to take the extrapolate the example of IPL, I mean, you, when you started IPL, the, the bench strength of the Indian cricket team, you know, skyrocketed. So, unless, you know, we have the large institutions which embrace the commodities, I mean, my, uh, you know, asset allocation is a very important, I completely agree with Lakshmi, asset allocation is a very important aspect of commodities. But I think we have to go beyond now that we have spent about two, three years, um, you know, and the the response has been good. The, uh, uh, you know, the uh, the whole story has been pretty good as far as the multi-asset, uh, you know, funds st uh, story is concerned. I think now it's time to go way beyond that and maybe look at standalone commodity funds, which are the need of the R. I mean, you know, we only talk about crude oil when it is approaching $90 or $100. And we have not even thought about this strategy about battery metals. So when mm. if we want to become a green tech superpower or a or an EV superpower, then you know uh, where is that uh, you know uh, sort of hedging mechanism or investing mechanism for the common investors? So I think there's a lot to be done over here.
Oh, I totally agree with that. But with that, we'll have to just slip into a very short break. But don't go anywhere because when we come back, we'll have this discussion continuing with our guests. We'll tell you or we'll ask them on what commodities should be in your portfolio and are commodities a good diversifier? Answers to all of those questions after this break. Welcome back and commodities in a portfolio is a question or uh, rather a debate that we have seen going on raging rather across global markets with the way the commodity prices have been moving and with the way the funds really are making a killing in sense of returns there as well. So this one is to you Vikram. I do understand as, as Lakshmi also said that gold and silver is perhaps we are at right now and that also just about uh, on the surface, there are various whole host of commodities. I mean, international markets are making a killing when it comes to cocoa, which is at all-time highs, or a coffee, which is trading at an 18-month highs, or a corn or a palm oil. I mean, wh where is India when it when it comes to all of these price moves? So uh, let me tell you how the you know uh, the introduction of gold and silver ETF has affected the domestic uh, commodity markets. So today, you know, we don't have a spot exchange as far as gold and silver is concerned. So uh, gold and silver ETFs have become a proxy spot for uh, the Indian market, the listed spot. Otherwise, rest all the spot prices, whether from the exchange or from the you know various association, it's a derived price. But here is a here is a you know security which gives you the perfect spot price uh, as far as the Indian market is concerned. Also, you know instead of you know uh, buying gold and silver bar and shoving it under your mattress, they remain. In the financial market which provide the liquidity and they can be utilized for you know a lot of stuff which you cannot do with uh, gold and silver offline so i think this is this is one thing which is underappreciated as far as the gold and silver etfs are concerned it's its contribution to the local market in terms of liquidity and everything else so i think once once we have similar products in other commodities whether it is energy or softs it'll have a it'll have a you know significant impact on the local liquidity and also it will result in the cost going down and maybe you know uh, even if, even if you don't have a spot pr price you know these ETFs can act as a uh, you know proxy for the uh, genuine spot prices in india mm. so i think that is something which needs to be done for these things to take up otherwise you know if you only have futures and options which will have uh, you know today 90% of the liquidity in all exchanges and derivative is through algo trading which is not uh, you know dependent upon any sort of fundamentals so you know you need uh, physically backed products which you know sort of provide the real story the real picture of the market Hmm. Vikram, uh, very well said. Uh, and But you know, when you look at the Indian markets itself, we have our futures and options, yes. Uh, and then we have ETFs and funds as well coming in. But it took a very long time for gold to just get, uh, get in there. Silver has taken another few years and now we have that as well. How soon, how much before we get metals, energy and all of these softs? Would you say it's, it's a very, very slow process with what we're going through? I think we, as a fraternity, uh, the investment fraternity from the fund side, I think we are equally responsible for the slow of, you know, uh, process because, uh, you know, these things have to be driven at the, uh, you know, at the association levels. So unless there is a thrust, I mean, you have to understand, appreciate the regulator has been uh, fairly brave enough to approve commodities in mutual fund three, three four years back. Uh, considering what happened in the commodities not too long uh, before that. Mm. So I think uh, it's it's really appreciable what SEBI has done despite, you know, all the apprehensions. And obviously the fund houses have done a good job in, you know, uh, living up to the expectation in terms of safety, security, liquidity, etc. But I think in a way, uh, you know, right now it is not a focus. As Lakshmi uh, mentioned that, you know, we are an, still an equity uh, driven uh, market but i think I, I always believe you know fix the roof before it starts leaking so mm. you know if you want to double your size of the economy uh in, well in percentage terms the commodity consumption may not skyrocket but in absolute terms you know it will be some gigantic numbers i mean today you're consuming five million barrels of oils per oil per day 800 900 tons of uh, gold uh, sorry uh, five, uh, 900 tons of gold uh, annually so if the Economy size doubles. Well, the five million will not become ten million, but you're looking at somewhere around seven or eight million barrels per day of oil, 200 tons of gold. So it may not show up as a higher number in the current account deficit, 
but it will be very, very high in absolute terms. And it is not easy to find those commodities on tap. So I think this is a time where, you know, uh, whether it is a regulator or the associations and the various you know, stakeholders to get together and plan a roadmap so that in the next five, 10 years, when we are there, uh, you know, um, you know, we don't have to, you know, sort of uh, uh, look for clues what to do at that, at that point of time. Mm. Lakshmi, what's your sense also on what really needs to be done? One and second is uh, with whatever commodities that are available right now with the funds, how much of that uh, should be a part of your portfolio? So, Manisha, to your first part of the question, Rome was not built in a day. Uh, you know, it took it took really a long time to get gold and silver uh, into the country, into the ETF format. And obviously, uh, uh, precious metals is something which even the retail investor understands. Uh, whereas if you talk about the other commodities, specifically the energy pack, which is largely crude oil, or for that matter, base metals, uh, it's predominantly uh, understood by the institutional investor and maybe traded uh, if, if possible, by the retail investor as well. So I think um, uh, making some of these uh, in a basket format uh, available could be a starting point. And, and I think it's a happy uh, add-on to have as part of the portfolio. Uh, but as I said, uh, to, and, and that uh, ties into your second part of the question, how much of these kind of um, funds or categories can one have into the portfolio? Well, I'd still maintain that these are all complementary, uh, you know, uh, add-ons to your portfolio. Can it be the core? So uh, very unlikely given the cyclicality of each of these commodities at varying times and points. You're seeing gold rally today, but has it always been the case? Well, answer is no. So I think focus on core wealth creation, which is predominantly done through equities, have stability through fixed income. But definitely there are opportunistic, uh, you know, options available through commodities. And one should definitely look to harness that, especially in times like these, where uh, almost most every commodity is shining. Mm. Lakshmi, let me put this question another way as well. Would you call commodities a good diversifier in a portfolio? Most certainly. Definitely, yes. Uh, it is a diversifier to your portfolio. Be mindful of the risks for sure, because some of them just kind of jump into a bandwagon without understanding the risk. But certainly, diversity, it does offer. Mm. You know, uh, when you talk about equities, and yes, we lean way too much onto that. But when it comes to gold versus the gold companies, whether it's gold loan companies or jewelry companies, we do see a lot of interest into that one. Do you also see in some sense as we move forward from here, of people understanding more of the underlying commodities because yes whether it's a tire company or a sugar company there is an underlying commodity there and there should be arbitrage opportunities available for that would you say we're getting there they will have no choice manisha but to be able to understand the underlying asset class rather than just purely chasing momentum uh, well uh, ai is doing its bit. Uh, but apart from that, you have to apply your own IQ and EQ when you are making these kind of investments. Uh, are we yet there? Well, the honest answer is no. But are we uh, intending to get there? The answer is yes. <laughs> All right. Uh, Vikram, this one is to you. So, well, gold is done and so is silver now. What is the kind of growth would you say we've seen in the last couple of years, especially now in the last couple of months where the prices have been uh, anything but skyrocketing? So, uh, Manisha, if you allow me, I'll disagree with what Lakshmi says. And I think that is the problem with the uh, development of this market in, in India. Because, you know, when you are touting gold returns with equity returns and debt returns, it clearly shows that, you know, it is some sort of a uh, confusion you're creating in the minds of the investors. I mean, there, there are three different classes. I mean, who compares uh, the returns of debt with equity? So why are we comparing debt of, uh, you know, returns of commodity with equity? Why, why it is being done? So I think that is the biggest problem, the mindset issue that we have and that needs to be resolved uh, as far as the development of the Indian market. Secondly, uh, you know, as far as, uh, you know, development of the gold market is concerned, uh, you know, uh, what we have seen that in a country which imports roughly about two and a half, three lakh crores worth of gold, the AUM is not even 10% of that. So I think from here it can go even higher. And as the, you know, the size of the portfolios increases, there will be greater demand for portfolio diversification. And I think that could be a story which will give traction to, uh, you know, a higher participation of investors and funds in the gold market. So that's how I see it in the future.
Hmm. So, Vikram, uh, according to you, how much should one's portfolio be commodities right now? I mean, I know we have very limited choices here, gold and silver perhaps, but how much of holding of that? So, I think if your portfolio is skewed towards fixed income, then you don't need too much of gold. Hmm. Uh, if, you th if your portfolio is skewed towards equity, then you need a higher allocation to gold. And uh, I think um, I mean, there, there was a study done by World Gold Council which mentioned that anywhere between 5 to 15 percent, anything above or below that is suboptimal. So that is the range that you have depending upon where the skew of your portfolio lies. Lakshmi, what would you say? I mean, I, even if gold is a replacer in debt as a segment, how much would you want or advise holding gold? I would say about uh, 10 to 15 percent of your total 100 rupee allocation uh, in a portfolio, I think, is fairly optimal, though globally there are studies uh, which don't really give you uh, the precise number uh, that that kind of, uh, you know, fits best. But I, th I think anything around this range uh, should be fairly appropriate. Uh, and then this is excluding uh, the amount of, uh, you know, uh, the tons of other kind of gold uh, in the non-investment format that one already tends to own. So I think, uh, therefore, that around the 10-15 number, uh, percent number, I think is a fairly sweet spot uh, to let your portfolio be truly diversified. All right. So if you want your portfolio truly diversified, commodities or debt perhaps is the way to go for that. And within this as well, with the kind of run-up that we've seen in commodities, even if it's for a near term or a shorter term, it does find place in your portfolio. Lakshmi Vikram, thank you so much for joining us today and taking us through all those details and, of course, what needs to be done going forward uh, with the kind of uh, movement that India is seeing in sense of financialization. Commodities perhaps will have a bigger role to play. But with that, that's all the time that we have on Commodity Champions. Thank you for watching.